Hello, and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hofdahl. And today we're talking about the movie Signs. Meg, I remember when this movie came out in 2002, it literally came out the weekend that we were in Chicago for Flashback Weekend, which is like a horror and sci-fi convention. We were there to see Bruce Campbell. We got back, and you and Luke... Um, went to see it in Duluth and my dad and I went to see it in Virginia because we lived in different places then. And we, the next time we saw each other, we were like, Oh my God, did you see signs? And we freaked out. Do you remember that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a really good memory. I don't, I didn't remember when I'd like seen it the first time. I knew we had gone to it right away. Cause you know, M night Shyamalan and Sixth sense was so amazing. And you know, I, this is this after unbreakable. No, well, may, yeah, maybe. Um, but this, okay, this movie, like I said, came out in 2002. It had a budget of $72 million. It made $408 million at the box office. So people were there. And yes, it's on, after Unbreakable. It's only 73% on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, that's still really good. But um, can I just say, and the... <laughs> Why am I always starting off these podcasts with how thirsty I am for the men in them? But, and it's not Mel Gibson. <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix. Okay. Do you remember him in Quills and like the character and it was like forbidden romance. And then Joaquin Phoenix as, as Johnny Cash in what was that called? Walk the Line. And Joaquin Phoenix in this movie, like maybe he didn't do anything for me in 2002, but right now he's doing things for me. <laughs> Yes, I remember him all those things. I remember my my brother saying, "Have you seen O'Kane Phoenix in Quills?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a vivid memory. But yes, uh, maybe maybe because my brother's in love with him, I like feel this. I feel like he's my brother's. Maybe that's what it is. So, oh, so you're not in love with him? I I you know I love Johnny Cash more than anybody in the world. So I love I love when he plays him. But you know. I, I think he's hot, but yeah, maybe it's just one of those things where he, he you feel like he's somebody else's. Like, even like Bruce Campbell, like, I love Bruce Campbell. I think he's hot, but he's yours. Does that make sense? Yeah, because Carrie Elwes is yours. Yeah. So, I mean, at least we know who each other's <laughs> men are. So when they come in this room, well, we'll see. We'll see what really happens when, it, when, it, when they offer their body. <laughs> You know, the speaking of that, like I remember in high school, like there were these couple of guys that my, my friend and I were like, oh, they're cute. And like, I thought I liked this one and she thought she liked this other one. And so then when the four of us got together, those guys had actually decided that they liked the opposite one. And so we went to the bathroom and you're like, are you, we were like, are you okay with that? And she's like, yeah, and I'm like, I am too. So then we just ended up switching. I mean, nothing even ever came out of it, but that's who we hung out with that night because they decided like. They weren't, we, they were interested in the opposite. So, you know, if Bruce Campbell wants to make out with you, I'll deal with it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that would be weird, though, if Bruce Campbell and Carrie came here and then they wanted the opposites. I mean, I guess we'd make if that's our If that's our biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the biggest problem we have to deal with in our lives, like, I think I can live with that. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, so Mel Gibson is problematic, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But these kids in the movie, they're so great. And Ab little Abigail Breslin, she's so tiny. She's so cute. You can see why she was a child star. I mean, she's adorable. And, of course, Rory Culkin. Is it Rory? Is that his name? Or Kieran? Kieran. Okay. Kieran Culkin just has the Culkin vibe. But, yeah, let's just – why don't we just say Mel Gibson is problematic, but we will talk about him the least amount of time that we can. I cannot get over, like, okay, little Abigail Breslin, that line when she's like, can I have a glass of water? Or she's like, there's a monster in my room. Can I have a glass of water? Like, give it to me, that line reading and how this movie is shot. I know not everybody loves M. Night Shyamalan or like, yeah, he hasn't made every movie perfect, but who's done everything perfect in their lives? This movie is so well done. I'm so glad you said that because <clears throat> this is something that really gets me annoyed is I feel like people's... And I'm going to say people's, but I mean Luke's anger toward M. Night Shyamalan is so ridiculous and unjustified. Has he made some crappy movies? Yes. But so has everybody. I just don't understand why people get so upset. Is it because it was his first movies were so 
good and he didn't have any like bombs before that i don't know what it is but i think people need to relax and give him a little bit of room and also when you're as creative as him and you do and you push boundaries like how he has you're going to have some fails you're going to have some epic fails he's not michael bay he's not trying to make the same movie over and over again he's trying to do different things so everybody give him a break i mean put it into the context of like other artists i mean it like you like a band. Do you love every song of theirs? I mean, probably not. Do you love every album? Probably not. Do you love every book that a certain author has written? I mean, the chances are, if they've written a lot, probably not. So why would we expect that, you know, every, like somebody's going to create everything that we love or everything needs to be perfect? So yeah. Also, I kind of feel like I want to go back and watch some of his other movies because I feel like maybe. I came into them with different attitudes than I should have. And it's like, in my mind, I'm like, well, the village is just a huge mess. and It's terrible. But I'm like, you know, maybe it's not. Like, maybe if I go back and watch it, like, maybe it's not the big pile of poop I thought it was. I don't know. I know. It's it's about that expectation again. And just those people, like, saying in our ear, like, oh, guess what? This, is, this isn't as good as these other ones. So, you know, you shouldn't even – it's not even worth your time. It's like, well – Maybe, maybe it is. Speaking of this movie, again, I love this concept and exploring fate and signs and destiny and what does it mean? And then like these crop circles, like I was thinking we could talk about the science of crop circles in in one of our books because that is fascinating on its own. And are they all hoaxes? Like what's going on? Well, I love aliens and I... I think it's been well documented on this podcast that I'm kind of a cynic. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in like afterlife and a lot of things that other people do. And that's okay. People can believe what they want. But aliens, I kind of, it's kind of my jam. And I do believe that we just, this is such a vast universe. It's hard to believe that there are no other beings somewhere it doesn't mean that they like are the little green men or that they are the ones that left the crop circles but i feel like the likelihood of them existing versus ghosts is way higher to me so i really i'm i'm very fascinated by aliens and i want to learn more and like i i like the little sort of clues about roswell and different things and i want to storm area 51 Yes, that that I think it's time. I think it literally might be very soon. Um, this movie is so well written. The first time the sheriff calls him father, um, I I said it's like the blinking guy gif, you know, because it's like, wait, what now? Like, why did you call him father? Because it's just subtle and it's like we don't really know yet. And it's just this nice hint and this this theme of he's lost his faith and he doesn't believe in signs anymore, but his brother you know wants him to, and the kids really need him to because that's who his identity was based on. Like it's so well written. And I I was just I was just reading something the other day about how foreshadowing um, only works if it's far enough in advance where you can see it come back into play later and. And it's not like two minutes ahead of time. It's like, oh, I'm really good at picking locks. And then you pick a lock, you know, like you just told a story. And this movie does the foreshadowing so well and putting in all these elements. So by the end, we are primed and ready. You were talking about good writing. And I feel like one way to describe it is it feels like there is not one word too many. Every line... Like, it's a very sort of spare movie where there's not a ton of talking, but when someone's talking, it's important and every word matters. Uh, so, yeah, there's something about the cadence of the writing that is just, it kind of sucks you in. And this is the, I think this is the first time I've seen this movie since I've had kids. I've saw it quite a few times when it came out, but it's been forever. And when he tells them their birth stories oh and the timing of when he tells their birth stories and that's something my boys love that that that's kind of a thing that you know I tell them kind of over and over again about when they were born and they love it and so it just brought such a like an emotional punch to me that again doesn't happen until maybe you're in later years of your life and so I don't know it was just it was really poignant the way that they did that that too, like I just rewatched this movie like a week ago and I rewatched it with you last night and 
it made me cry just as hard last night as it did when I rewatched it last week because the reason he's telling them their birth stories is because he believes they're going to die. And, and the next morning we find out like his brother's like, you didn't think we'd live through the night, did you? And he's like, no. So he thinks this is their last night on earth. He's going to tell them the story of their births. He's talking about their mother who has passed and he's letting them choose their dinner. And they he thinks they're having their last meal on earth together as a family. I cannot handle it. It's so well written. And again, just a really subtle thing. And it's not like, I love you guys and gripping them and like, I, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm going to tell you the story of your birth very slowly and specifically. Yeah, it's so sweet. And um, you were talking about how well the foreshadowing is, but also the flashback um, mm. that I like made like a mental note, like this is just masterful flashback because it's throughout the whole movie is we're flashing back to one incident, obviously a, a very important incident. And we're just getting a little bit further along and a little bit further along until finally we like get to see him interact with his wife. And we realize why she said those words that she said. Um, I have goosebumps. Uh, yeah. It's just so, so well done. So my question to you is, are you in group one? Or are you in group two? I'm I'm the people with faith and you're in the other group. Yeah, but but I but I'm scrappy and you love me anyway, right? <laughs> we love each other and that's why we work. Yeah, I mean and I felt I feel like maybe it would be easy to say well, there as someone like myself who who does not believe in coincidence or who does not believe that the universe is helping me or that I have like or if there's any greater meaning. I don't believe in those things. And I feel like it would be easy for me to watch this movie and say, well, I feel like they're saying that I'm an idiot or like that, that I'm, that I am doing it wrong. But I don't think that's what they're saying. I think that what they're saying is he is a group one person and he turned into a group two person because of something bad that happened to him. But everybody needs him to go back to being a group one person because that's who he is. And it's okay to be one or the other, but he had to have his journey of going back to group one, if that makes any sense. Yes, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, I love this dynamic of the brothers co-parenting and Um, Meryl, that's the Joaquin Phoenix character of, you know, he was great in high school at a sport and then he never made it big. I mean, he, according to this plot, has that skill of being great at baseball because he's got to defeat the aliens. But I just think that that dynamic is really interesting and we don't necessarily explore or get to see that brotherly or, you know, co-parenting as brothers dynamic in I don't know. I can't I can't think of of many films or or TV shows that do that. And so I love that. Um that that first night when they see the figure on the barn roof and then they're going to go out cuz they just think it's these brothers. Like that's really well done and 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 funny too. Like there's there's things there's times when I laugh out loud and it's yet it's still super creepy. Yeah, I think what surprises me about this movie or at least surprised me this last time was how many jump scares there are is actually quite scary i when i like think back when i was thinking back on it before this rewatch i didn't really think of it as a scary movie um but it is actually quite scary um so that's something i appreciated were the jump scares unfortunately the cgi at the end i didn't think was very well done and that kind of took me out of the movie and was kind of like nah. but Overall, I really like the jump scares and the way they show the aliens sort of subtly. Another line that is golden, Abigail Breslin again gets to deliver it, is she says the same show is on every station. And that at that specific time really means something. I mean, it could still mean something now, but I feel like right now, you know, we would get the alerts on our phones or somebody would be texting you or calling you or whatever, but she's just trying to change the channel. But every, every station is showing the news because something has happened. And I just, it was so powerful. Yeah. That's a good goosebump moment. And I also, I felt like they, they kind of talk about, and this is, I don't know when this movie was filmed. I'm just, I have to assume it was written before nine 11. Um, and I don't know when it was filmed, um, in relation to nine 11, but it made me think of when that happened, 
how everyone, and I don't think I'm just talking about myself, I think most everyone was just consumed with watching t- television and watching the news and just being absolutely, like, encased in all of it. And, like, at what point there's this sort of argument of are they going to watch TV and, like, be a part of it or are they going to sort of, like, pretend like it's not happening and just shut it away? And, and then the TV ends up being in the closet and the kids end up watching it anyway. But it's just sort of an interesting statement about how we as humans react to these things. I, I agree. And I think that is really profound. And um, it feels so small because it's they're in a small town. They're in Pennsylvania. They are surrounded by, you know, corn and crops. Um, I love if you notice there's a lot of shots that are overhead, like when they're traveling into town and back that are showing patterns in regular everyday things. So we're seeing the patterns of the cul-de-sacs and we're seeing the patterns of the the roads and the road signs and the buildings. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, the crop circles, hearkening back to that and the, the aliens navigation system. But there's patterns in everyday things that we don't even see or appreciate because we're not seeing them from that height. And I thought that was beautiful filmmaking. Ooh, yeah, that's not something I noticed. I, I think you pick up on aesthetic... Um... And those sort of things a lot easier than I do. But I, I'm i still thinking about crop circles and how freaky deaky they are. Like, how is that a thing? I know. And why? And who came up with it? Or, I mean, if it is aliens, what's the purpose? And are is it just a hoax? And, like, what's going on? I don't know. It's creepy. Okay, can you imagine? And, I mean, you obviously have written about this, and this is a spoiler alert, um, written about this in your novel, but can you imagine the guilt of killing someone accidentally and what great character motivation and, like, having to deal with that? Like, good on you for for, uh, including that in, in your debut novel because that has to be, like, one of the most compelling things to to think about and write about and get in that character's head. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I I wanted to explore it because I think it's just a fascinating thing that can happen. And I who knows? I mean, maybe maybe this movie inspired me. I don't know, but um I think that his performance, M. Night Shyamalan's performance is, is really good, even though it's just like this short little sliver of time that we see this guy. But, you know, it's funny because those that's one of those things, and that's the whole point of the movie. That's one of those things where you can say why, bad things happen to good people. So why... Why do bad things happen to good people? And I think that's what group one and group two is always trying to figure out. And maybe that's what I'm trying to figure out. And that's why I wrote about it in my book. But I think also they're trying to figure it out in this movie. Because from what we can tell, that veterinarian who did that didn't mean to do it. He didn't do anything really overtly wrong. And a a good woman is dead. And now two people's more than two people's lives are ruined. So it's kind of, I think it's such a good example of sort of a conundrum that all humans are trying to figure out and we all take different ways to sort of figure it out. You know, another example of the writing and in indirect uh, reference to the, the Ray character, the M. Night Shyamalan character who, who ended up killing the wife accidentally in the beginning, when the dog is acting strangely and pees on the floor and then ends up attacking the daughter, um, Mel Gibson says, call the doctor. And they'll, and then the son says, well, he's not a vet. And he's like, no, he's, but he'll, he'll know what to do. It's because he can't call the vet in town. They're in a small town, and that's the guy who killed his wife. Yeah, that's a really good uh, sort of moment that you don't realize at the time, the, the subtext and, I mean, just this idea that you see the person in town who killed your wife, and he didn't mean to kill your wife, and how are you supposed to, how is anyone supposed to live through that? How is anybody supposed to, like, get up in the morning and go somewhere and see the person who killed your family member? But this is a reality that people have to live. And I love taking that kind of... uh 
sort of moral, all these sort of moral quandaries and issues and things that people have to deal with, and then throwing aliens and crop circles into it. Like, I love it. You know, um, I'm going to come back to that, but you mentioned, like, seeing him in town, and they were eating, they were sitting down to pizza, and then they saw that guy in town just getting into his vehicle, and then later, you know, when they're in their last meal, there's two scenes where a meal is involved, and then, you know, people feel, like, sick to the stomach, and they can't eat, that I could feel feel that in my body those scenes it's so well written and so well acted like yeah there's no way I could take a bite of that food either I'm feeling what they're feeling and like you said taking these 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 moral things maybe you know sort of a small premise in a small setting but it's a big idea and these aliens coming in but we're they're showing it through this small family and there's no need to be intercutting you know with scenes across the nation and like seeing these planes taking off and like the military gearing up i mean i i know that there's alien movies that do that and that's what they are like a michael bay movie but what i mean they they didn't need to do that it is on such a small scale yeah we're seeing it on the news but literally it's so small we don't the budget had to be minuscule compared to what, you know, like Independence Day was, for example. Yeah, I was thinking, like, you would think that this movie was written for someone who didn't have a budget. But I'm assuming this being, I think, his third movie and the first two being very successful, they could they had a lot of money. So that wasn't an issue. Um, but, yeah, I really like this concept. It was something I kind of... You know that sort of like corkboard in your mind where you put little sticky notes? It was like this little sticky note I had where I was like, that's something I want to do someday. I want to write a story that's that's just on one family in one house pretty much, but it but there is a bigger scale issue going on. I love that idea where you, where you have a, a family or a small group of people and we're only seeing it from their eyes. You're right. Like, they could have intercutted a bunch of stuff. They have that little home movie, which I think was really effective mm-hmm. and scary. But they didn't show um, Will Smith, like, trying to fight them. Which I think that this movie is, is a, it's a family drama that has aliens in it. <laughs> this setting, I mean, give me some of that good cornfield action. And just those clicking noises. Like you said, the the CGI isn't great, which is fine, whatever. But we didn't need to see the alien. Like when we see it through the reflection of the TV set, that's enough for me. And it, that is scary AF. Um, this movie makes me um, reminiscent of, speaking of that setting, like I used to live in the country and it made me reminisce about my old house in the country. And it's so dark and so quiet, um, you know, at night that if there's, headlights coming down the driveway it's like what's going on because that's so rare now you know I live where there's cars driving by all the time but it's it's that setting it's very secluded and so oh someone's on the roof yeah that's not okay yeah you can't just like think oh maybe the the neighbor's messing on his roof next door and it'll be fine well um we were just watching uh Queer Eye and he and they were pulling up into like some rural farmhouse and one of them is like you guys like this is where horror movies happen <laughs> and it's true i mean this con- this is not a new concept there's something freaking terrifying about being out in the middle of nowhere you know you were talking about um something globally happening and then but we're just seeing it through on a small scale and i also wrote down like this they rem- this reminded me of 911 and watching the tv and just being glued to it no new information was coming in but yet 24 hours a day that news cycle we were just glued to it um and then that also reminded me about a play that premiered several years later um and it was just about um it was at a restaurant and it was about couples on their first dates post 9-11 or the night of 9-11 and like how they're handling that and just like okay we're supposed to be on this we're on a first date but all this stuff is happening in the world and how are we supposed to be talking to each other um when like all of this is happening in the world. And I think that's a really interesting place to write. I mean, anything from is how do you deal with it on the small scale? Like, yeah, we know how the military is dealing with it. And we, we see what's happening in that room in the Pentagon. Like they're deciding, you know, to send the nukes, but how do we handle this in this farmhouse in Pennsylvania? Oh yeah. I like that. You know, M. Night Shyamalan must be from Pennsylvania because he sets, like, all of his movies there, or a lot of his movies there. But I always feel like it's, like, this ode to Night of the Living Dead. I don't know. Bucks County, Pennsylvania, I feel like 
isn't that where Night of the Living Dead takes place? I mean, pretty close. So I always, I always feel that connection, and I got to think about that farmhouse in that movie, and and um, how that's we're seeing the zombie apocalypse from a small scale, you know? Yeah, and this had this has a lot of Night of the Living Dead um, feel too, like when they're nailing up the windows and the doors and everything. I mean, it just has that feel. And speaking of of nostalgia. This, when this movie came out, this was the height of our X-Files obsession. This was also the height of us living our lives. I mean, we, I was single, you, you and Luke were dating, but we didn't have kids. We were just living our lives. Like, what were we even doing, Meg? We were doing whatever we wanted. We were doing whatever we wanted. Like you said, we were just hanging out with Bruce Campbell at that convention. And then apparently we went and saw signs separately and then we went and talked about signs <laughs> so yeah we have to carve out this little bit of time while my husband took the kids to the fair to talk about signs again <laughs> it all comes back around you know um you mentioned that already the just the footage from that birthday party scene in brazil it is so powerful and then seeing joaquin's reaction to it and like he's up against the tv screen trying to see what the kids are going to going to see and then jumping back in that closet it's so powerful and it, it proves to once again it doesn't have to be a lot to be scary you're right subtlety is key especially when you can do it right um we were watching the movie with campbell and it was kind of fun because he was reacting to things uh, quite lo- you know loudly and you could kind of like very effusively and you could see what he was how he was thinking and feeling and there's this scene where um uh the little boy and I can't think of his name but um he gets grabbed through the grate Morgan Morgan and Campbell's like well did he get him did he get him because the way that they shoot it is like you can't see what's happened like there's a tussle and the the lights going and everything like that and he just he very much embodied what everybody's thinking and feeling at that moment you know so it's kind of just fun to see it through his eyes yeah no it's a good point and I too like this reminded me of because I just wrote about it in our uh, our second book but it reminded me of The Visit I mean and that's a found footage movie so it's shot very specifically that way but how M. Night Shyamalan shoots this movie he's not showing the struggle with the alien he's showing the flash flashlight falling on the floor and then Abigail Breslin's little feet coming over and picking it up and even then very slowly it's so it's paced not you know in a in a panicked way she shines the flashlight over to her uncle and then he shines the flashlight over and then finally it's revealed that Morgan is struggling to breathe but it's minutes go by it's so well shot it's so well shot he has such a good eye for those things and again, people who are trying to write scripts and like get into the biz, think of these things for your budget too. Like, yeah. I mean, you can make it look amazing and you don't have to show things and actually sometimes not showing it makes it all the scarier and you're more intrigued and you're more invested in what's happening. Oh, I agree. Okay. So right before that scene that we were just talking about is their last meal um, he lets them pick whatever they want. Morgan picks uh, French toast and mashed potatoes. Um, Meryl picks chicken teriyaki. Um, I can't think of Abigail Breslin's character name, but she picks spaghetti. Bo picks spaghetti, and then Mel Gibson picks um, a cheeseburger with extra bacon. Meg, what would you pick for your last meal? And let's say that you you know have the stomach to eat it and not feeling sick and terrified. But if you had to pick one meal, like you could have whatever you wanted, what would you pick? Like I'm about to go in the electric chair. <laughs> I guess. But could you even eat then too? Like I, I never understand. Like, couldn't, can you really, like if you're going to, you know, walk the green mile? Oh, wow. That's tough. That's really tough. Okay. So my dad always says um, he would ask for fish for his last meal if he was going to the electric chair because he's allergic to seafood. Oh, right. And so it would be like an F you because <laughs> he'd die <laughs> eating his fish. But I mean, I think I would just pick something like my my most favorite pasta dish from like a, a certain restaurant or something. I mean, if it had to be something I made myself, you know, I mean, maybe pizza or pasta. And that's kind of boring, but... I don't know. Well, right now I'm obsessed with Impossible or Beyond Burgers because they're so good. But, but what do you think? 
the only thing that's coming into my mind are just I love like biscuits with butter. Yeah. Like just just bread. I just want warm bread and butter. Like Cracker Barrel, barrel or Red Lobster. Yeah, Cracker Barrel. I like. I mean, I love Red Lobster biscuits, but like if it's gonna be just like real, it's real time. I I gotta have just the classic biscuit with butter and maybe some strawberry jelly. Wow. Now I'm feeling hungry. <laughs> this is, no, that's, that's amazing. Um, this movie, it ends up with, you know, all the things that came into play in fate. Um, the reason that Bo never liked water or she always thought there were amoebas in it or contaminated was because all of these glasses of water need to needed to be left around the house. The reason Morgan had asthma was so that his lungs could be closed when the alien shot the poison. The reason Merrill is good at baseball and never moved away and joined the major leagues is because he needed to be there with that baseball bat like they set it up the you know it's a little bit problematic I'm I'm a little sad that the mother had to die in order to relay this message like that was her purpose and fate and like they meant they mentioned um, she mentions it and Ray mentions it that it was meant to be that she died that she got hit because it was you know the chances were slow but you know I love that idea of no coincidences it's fate it's destiny and all of these things line up perfectly and like you said, how they pace that, the flashbacks, and then it's all revealed in that moment. And he just says, Meryl, swing away. Like, the writing! Yeah, it's it's so well done. It, it culminates. It's not, you know, obviously there's like a, tw- there's the whole M. Night Shyamalan twist. It's not really a twist because if you are paying close attention, obviously, you, maybe it would, it, you'd get some sort of general idea. I don't know if anybody could really figure out exactly what's going to happen. Um, so I, I don't know if it's necessarily what I'd call a twist, but it's just, it culminates into such a beautiful moment. And of course it ends with him finding his faith again. And he sort of sees, um, that the universe in, in this alternate reality, this, un, the universe cares and everything comes together. And so he, he gets to sort of be back to the person that, that he needs to be. And then, so it has a happy ending, which is nice and doesn't always happen in horror movies. That line um, Morgan comes to after we think he might be dead. And he said, did somebody save me? And the dad says, I think, yeah, someone did. And it means his mom from beyond the grave. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's just, again, like the writing and the dialogue and just the delivery of everything. And yeah, the fact that like these brothers are living together and he moved in to help him with his kids it's just and then like when he's like I wish you were my dad and he's like don't ever say that and there's just so many there's so many good parts and it's just it's a really emotional movie and I feel like it's one of those things you shouldn't watch unless you're like ready to be ready to be emotional (laughs) you know and something I appreciate it I mean there's not a lot of women in this movie but I appreciate that the sheriff is a woman it's Cherry Jones and she's incredible and and so I, I like that because that could have easily been just a male character and it wouldn't have meant anything. Yeah, that's true. I definitely, that is that is a complaint I have. I, I, I wish there were some more women in this movie, but yeah, that could have easily been been a male character. So I do appreciate that. And also it was cool to see Merritt Weaver. I didn't realize that was her in the pharmacy. So it's fun to watch these old movies and then be like, oh, remember when? And oh God, her delivery, that's so funny because she's doing her confession, even though he doesn't want to hear it. And she's whispering the words that she, the swear words. And she says, shits and bastards. And then she's like, is douchebag a swear? Well, then instead of swearing 37 times, I swore 71 times. Like, it's so funny. It's so well written. Yeah, that was, that's a really uh, good part. I love that. It's so funny and sort of exposing again that he's, he's like, I'm not, I don't do this anymore. You don't need to tell me about it anymore. And it kind of like sort of shows the character of this the the actual town and gives us just a little bit of humor and it's so good let's rank signs on a scale of zero to ten. Zero being you hated it ten being you think it's a perfect movie um my my obvious scale would be crop circles but do you have a a more clever scale no i think crop circles is good so how many crop circles do you give signs i give signs Eight and a half crop circles because it made me feel emotions. Um, it has good jump scares in it. It's well written. Um, it's just, it's a really good movie. Uh, I just wish there were more women in it. 
And I mean, I, there's really nothing I can dock it for. Um, it, it's just a really good, solid movie. I'm giving it 10 out of 10 because that's how much I loved it in my rewatch. And it, I remember loving it, but it surprised me how well it, it held up. And I mean, looking at it now where I can appreciate things like story structure and dialogue and everything so much more, it's so well done. Again, my, my only complaint I think is, um, I wish there were more, more, more women in it, but um, I, like I said, I, I really like that dynamic of the brothers and everything. So well done. Well, make sure that you are following us on all of our social media to see where we're going to be this fall as we're promoting the science of monsters, our first book. And then also look for, um, you can pre-order now our science of monsters, or sorry, science of women in horror, which is our second book coming out in February, which is the women in horror month. It's perfect. Yeah. We're excited to be out and meeting people and, you know, come, uh, we'll be putting up, you know, whatever event that we may have. And, um, we're just ex- excited about our books. It's yay. Yeah. So see our website and our, or our social media. We're at horror rewind or horror and, uh, see where we're going to be. And we hope to see you there until next time. We'll see you in the horror section. <laughs>